Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of Learning Curves. I am so excited today because I have a very special guest today here with me, Mr. Stephen Clark. Hi, Hi Stephen. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming all the way from Fort Myers to join me. It's not a problem at all. This is I, I love the area here. Oh, yeah. Clearwater is great. That is nice. Kind of love it here. Stephen is a storyteller, and he has a great story behind him. You want to tell us a little bit about who you are and where you come from? Well, it's a, it, it started a long time ago. <laughs> uh, I spent 40 years as a television news anchor. Wow. Um, which is a, it's a fairly good career. That's a great, that's a long uh, time for a news anchor. Yeah, and I spent it in, uh, in some pretty good markets. Uh, we call markets yes. in the cities where we work. But um, uh, Detroit was my last mm -hmm. uh, posting before I retired the first time. Um, for 17 years, before that, New York City. Uh, before that, San Diego, spent about uh, nine years in San Diego, uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, Washington, D.C., and a couple small places like Colorado Springs and Wichita, but uh, 40 years in television news. And then um, I got out, uh, got a stupid offer to, to be in radio for a couple of years, so I did rock and roll radio in Detroit. For rock a couple and roll of radio years. in Detroit, that's yeah, fine. It was actually a lot of fun. <laughs> it, it wasn't really my strength. I, I'm more of a talker and less of a like talk at you, you know, like here's your song kind of thing. Right. But it, it was fun enough for the time, but then COVID came along and they came and offered to buy out my contract and it took me about a tenth of a second to say yes. <laughs> and uh, and I started, I wandered around a little bit and uh, and found this place down in Fort Myers Beach and convinced my wife to to sell her business and, and move on down to Fort Myers Beach and I've been there since. Wow. So did you move down? So you moved down to Fort Myers Beach during COVID? Yes, it was pretty much during the COVID thing. We bought our house down there and, uh, and came down as it was kind of petering out. Uh, for the most part, we survived COVID, although I had a very close call with it myself in Fort <laughs> Myers Beach. But um, came out of the other side of that and uh, life has been good, except for we had one really bad day. I know. That's yeah. actually how I discovered you. I know my husband, who's sitting right over uh -huh. here. You got my, my husband and Stephen are friends. Yep. And but it was funny, during the hurricane, I saw you reporting um, live. And I, I, you were the one I tuned in all the time to watch. And that was a Your total, reporting. That was incredible, though. It was a total accident. And because <laughs> I, I, I guess it's just instinct for me. There was all this news happening around me. <laughs> and I happened to be in the middle of it. And I couldn't ignore like saying something about it. And obviously I don't have a TV station anymore, but I had Facebook. Right. So I went on Facebook and the very first day after the hurricane, I commandeered a small boat from some people in Bonita Springs, which is south of Fort Myers Beach. I took that little boat up these absolutely devastated channels uh, and coastlines where I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. But I, funny enough, I was kind of in news mode. So I found myself just being like news correspondent in the middle of a disaster, forgetting the fact that this was my disaster. Right. But I, I came in with video and put it up on, online. At that time, I wasn't even doing like a Facebook Live. I just put the video online. It got like 2 million hits. 2 million hits. I, I spent 40 years in television. I don't think anybody ever saw me that much. Well, it was high. I mean, there was lots of news reporting, but I think you were able to really get in and show things. Um, through your reporting on Facebook that a lot of the other reporters weren't showing. Well, so what I, I found, found out also, uh, which I found to be very telling, and also mm -hmm. uh, I, I found myself guilty of it. Uh, in the business, we called it parachuting in. A disaster mm -hmm. happens, we virtually parachute into this location. We spend a day or two telling these heartfelt stories about people surviving the disaster, blah, 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 and then we leave. Right. And then we don't really ever even think back on it. And so, as I put it, Lester Holt left, so the disaster must be over. It wasn't over. And what I found out is, as I was trying to figure out what was going on around us, I couldn't find news anymore about what was going on. And it was literally in my yard. So I said, well, okay, I'll go out and I'll start telling people what's going on, just because I was tired of, of people I know sending me emails saying, well, I'm glad everything's getting back to normal. And I said, there's a, there's a car in my neighbor's pool. I don't think that's normal. Well, they weren't even letting anybody on the beach when you were reporting. Well, I, yeah, I snuck on the island. I many, know. I remember you saying that. <laughs> many times. Um, yeah, they closed it down, and I, and I guess they had their reasons. Um, they said, well, the emergency workers need to be able to do their emergency work without anybody being in their way. Okay, I, I get it. It's a legitimate reason, kind mm -hmm. of. But on the other hand, as a homeowner, I have a house that has been badly damaged. I have moldering furniture and materials all rotting in the basement. 
and I don't want to have to start putting up with the problems that will come from that, the, the, the right. mold. I said, you, I have to be allowed to get into my house to mitigate this ASAP. And also, in our particular instance, where we were on the island, um, there were fatalities nearby us. They were found early. Um, and could there have been more? Perhaps. But the emergency workers were, weren't really in my neighborhood. Right. They were in other neighborhoods. So I said, well, they're not in my neighborhood anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting anybody's way. I'm coming by boat. I'm docking at my dock. I'm getting out. I'm in my yard. I'm not getting in anybody's way. And so I went as often as I could and stayed there and just did as much work as we could. And my wife came on the island once with me when they let us, the one day they let us on the island, mm -hmm. two days after the storm. And we got a lot of stuff done, and then we were going to come back tomorrow and do more stuff, including empty the refrigerator and freezer, which we didn't do. So now suddenly I have to get there because now we've got a refrigerator and a freezer full of stuff that's going bad. So, you know, I, I just saw it. I said, as long as I'm not getting anybody's way, I will keep going and I will keep cleaning things what up. What was it like the first time going in, seeing it? Yeah, well, again, I was in this weird, I was in this weird place where I was in my, my television news correspondent's mind. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, like, describing and take a look at that. That house looks like the waves have probably hit it and it's collapsed. And someplace way in the back of my brain, I'm saying, oh, that's my neighbor's house. And then I see my house, and it's just like, okay, here's my house, and here's what's happened to it, and I'm, very, I'm being very dispassionate about it. But as I, when I stopped and I started thinking about it, I said, man, that was that's my that's house. my stuff. That's my, my house, house I'm talking about. Life. And know? so I, I think it became personal, which is why I think people were gravitating mm -hmm. towards my coverage is because no longer am I being that dispassionate reporter. Right. I am now being, I, I'm, I'm you. I'm with you also. And, and what I'm telling you is not filtered through anything other than what's, what's happening. Right. It's real. Yeah. It was weird. I bet that's <laughs> weird. <laughs> Covering your own story is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> Covering your own story. So did, um, it sounds like you had a lot of damage to your home. Well, um, we had, a, we had a, a fair amount of damage to the mm -hmm. lower third of our house. We're in one of those houses that are built technically on stilts, although the ground floor was closed in. But it was primarily a garage, mm -hmm. uh, workshop. My wife had a nice little yoga studio in it. We had a bar. Oh, and nice. all that was pretty much washed out. All that okay. was gone. Uh, as I tell people, we lost the lower third of our house, but we gained the top third of somebody else's house in our pool. So it all evened out in the final <laughs> analysis. I mean, it was, you got to laugh at it because if you don't, right. you're going to go crazy. <laughs> Um, but we did find, oddly enough, in our house, we found a whole bunch of other people's furniture inside of our ground floor. And we don't know where it came from. We don't know whose it was. I was thinking about holding it hostage. You know, just say, <laughs> hey, I got your mattress, and you can have it back for $20. Right. You know? <laughs> but at that point, you just drag everything out, uh, you know, whether it was yours or somebody else, drag it to the curb and let the big claw truck come and get it and take it away. Yeah. So. Wow. And I know afterwards um just from your reporting and everything you also are a singer because yeah. you wrote a few songs um you want to talk about that a little bit well i've always been a i've mm -hmm. always been a musician in fact before i went to college to be a uh, well i went to college to be a music major uh to be a performer to be a music teacher i didn't know exactly what i was going to do with music but that was what i was going to do and I played woodwinds. I played saxophone in the I jazz band. I played the band. saxophone in the right. jazz band. Right, I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's what I went to college to do. And mm -hmm. I was kind of really involved in that part of it. And then I kind of discovered journalism, and it lighted another little fire in my mm -hmm. brain. And but I've also always been kind of a gadget guy, and and so broadcast journalism became the thing that was attractive to me. And I kind of left music on a back burner, although I, I still tried to play my saxophone. But as you know, being a saxophone player. Playing a saxophone by yourself is kind of sad. It's kind yeah, of lonely. It it's is. like that guy in the subway, you know, just sitting there <laughs> playing the saxophone. You need to really have a band to you play do. with. You do. So what I did is I went and got a pawn shop guitar, taught myself to play guitar. Okay. And then I started on this journey of just kind of playing guitar, but meanwhile going down this road of being a journalist. And at some point it, it occurred to me that, well, I can be a journalist with music and I, and I can write songs. Yeah. So my all my early songs were really story songs. They were more of a story than they were the song right but I just started doing that and over the years the two just kind of paralleled each other and as I got later in my broadcast career um, my wife and I bought a place in Nashville so I could spend more time in Nashville where the best songwriting in the world happens nice and really learned to do what I was doing better so I went to Nashville and I, I started writing a lot of songs there and you recorded songs uh, there as well a right? couple of albums mm -hmm. of songs and uh, and now what I'm doing is I've, I've transitioned all the way back to my beginnings and when I moved to Fort Myers Beach 
I've become a beach bum uh, troubadour. <laughs> I, I'm looking for tiki bars to play my music. <laughs> and I was really on that track to do that. I, I started that. playing at a couple places in, mm -hmm. in Fort Myers Beach and in Bonita Springs. Uh, and, and writing new songs about the island life that we all live when we're down there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the hurricane hit. And that completely redefined my entire focus in life again. And so I decided I needed to do something about that. And I mean, you were saying, well, what do you do about that? I don't yeah. know what to do about that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to play music. I, wanted to, I didn't want there to be a hurricane. All these things were swirling around. But the thing I noticed was that all these people who were professional musicians that I was kind of trying to compete against, mm -hmm. suddenly none of us had jobs. No, it was because really they, sad. Every bar, every tiki bar, every restaurant and club in Fort Myers Beach was gone. And all these people who performed there uh, had no more work there. And a lot of people depended mostly there. I mean, some played other places. Yeah, but it's hard to move places. to another place if nobody knows who you exactly. are. Exactly. And plus, right. even like the Sanibels and, and the Captivas right. and places they played were also damaged. The Cape Coral, they, they, they all were damaged. So all these places were not having music. They, they didn't exist. And, so, and a lot of these people also lived on Fort Myers Beach or in these communities that were damaged. So I started saying, well, how, how can I help them? And uh, I'll take a jump back a couple of years, but my wife and I uh, ended up raising close to $1.5 million in Michigan uh, to build a playground for um, uh, disabled children, for children in wheelchairs, because we have a granddaughter nice. in a wheelchair. And we looked around one day, same kind of thing, and says, well, you know, we see that they have these barrier-free playgrounds, but generally they mm -hmm. put the kids with the special equipment over here and the other kids over here. Yeah. So I said, how do we build a playground that puts them all together? So you Yeah, know, so said, they can feel like they're part with the other kids. Exactly. So we ended up building this, <laughs> this huge playground, which has become a model for, <laughs> for playgrounds in the United States now. It is a phenomenal playground. We deeded it back to the, the city where, where we built it. And um, so anyway, great. I took that experience of saying I, I learned early in that process, We'd approach people and say, well, we're building a playground. Could you maybe, if you have a dollar or two, you know, Right, maybe. how to do fundraising. And by the end of that, it's kind of like, hi, how you doing? How much money do you have? Give it to me. <laughs> so we got really good at getting money from people. So I said, I'm going to put that skill to work here and see yeah. if I can get some money to somehow figure out how to pay musicians on Fort Myers Beach. So I ended up raising like 35000 bucks in a very short amount of time. That's great. How did you do that? Well, mm -hmm. mostly through GoFundMe, but also just by showing up at places and telling people what I was doing, and I would get $1,000 in a tip jar. And that money all, every single cent of that went back into this fund, uh, where my rule was simple. As so you were I was playing looking, at different events I would play, beach, yeah, I'd play right? even in Bonita Springs. I'd play wherever I could, but, and also when they started opening some of the bars uh, in Fort Myers Beach, a couple, mm -hmm. two or three bars opened up. Uh, and they could not afford to play, pay musicians. They were saying, well, we don't have enough money to pay musicians. We're barely open. Right. So what I'd say, I tell you what, I will pay your musicians to play here. And so I started hunting down Fort Myers Beach-based musicians, people who would have made a significant uh, income this particular season. And I called them up, and first of all, they thought I was crazy. They're going, now, who are you, and why do you want to pay me? <laughs> I would say, just trust me on this, and I'm not only going to pay you, I'm going to overpay you. I paid them more than what the going rate was. And oh, I said, I just so want you great. to play these days at this place, and then this place open. I said, I'll get you playing. So I had about 30 to 35 musicians who I managed to get at least three gigs each over the course of the first month or so. You know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but, you know, it's, it's a thousand bucks or so that they didn't have before. Right. And, and it also, the other side effect of that was, is it introduced the musicians to new bars and owners. And now I'm happy to say that virtually every bar that I was putting musicians at, those same musicians now have full-time gigs at those bars. That's and they great. are now be, getting paid by the bars. But when I would do a show like that, and then, then the other thing I did was pop-up concerts, where we did one where we used uh, Norm's Parking Lot. I don't know if you've ever yeah, heard of I'm Norm's Parking Lot. Norm's Parking Lot. Norm's mm. Parking Lot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Fort Myers Beach, right across from the Lottie yeah, Kai. Which, in case you don't know, Norm's Parking Lot is Chris Primo, my husband's parking lot, yeah, his parking lot. <laughs> on so, Fort Myers Beach. So and that's where I met Chris was was because I was set up in his parking lot doing a concert on Fort Myers Beach. And we had just a, that was a pop-up concert. We had a ton of people showed up, and that was one of those places I said, hey, every cent in this tip jar is going to the musicians of this beach. And I got a 1000 bucks that night. Just like that, from people who live on the beach saying, we want music, and so here it is. 
So that's been, that was my mission. I still have money left over, so I'll be hitting up Chris over there to figure out when we can uh, schedule something else. Yeah, you know, big. I want have, something big. I want something to, big. We need to come up with a really big fundraiser. Yeah, for big idea. So you've yeah. got all these business people that watch this thing here. Come on. You're business people. I need some business. That's right. We need some big ideas. Well, you still have the GoFundMe page up right now. It is still going up right now, and I would I would give you the link, but it. it, it I'll make sure that we put it, it in okay. my show notes. So if anybody wants to donate, I appreciate to the musicians that. because I will. Uh, I'll take a little break through the summer because things kind of slow down, yeah. which we desperately need on the island. <laughs> I think we'd love the speed that's going right now, but we do need to take a breather. But in the fall, I want to hit it again and mm -hmm. again. We've got September 28th coming up, which is the anniversary of Ian. Yes. And I would love to put something big. Together, so I'm looking over at Chris. Look, he's giving me that. Yeah, okay. We're gonna, we're gonna do something big, aren't we? Yes, sir. Yes, we are. We're gonna do something big. <laughs> yeah, but wait for those details. We'll make sure we let you know yep. <laughs> once we know all the details. So yeah. anyway, that's uh, that's my story. I'm well, sticking to I, it. I love that, and I know that um, you wrote a special song about Ian mm -hmm. and your experience. As a, as a songwriter, it's yes. it's impossible. Um, to not write about mm -hmm. things that affect me. And all my friends know that whatever they say around me is, is quite likely to become a song. So people have to be very careful what you tell me because <laughs> I will write. I'm like the Taylor Swift of old white guys. <laughs> I will write a song <laughs> about whatever you tell me. Um, but I wrote Ian, uh, and it was a hard song to write. It was because, you know, I can write a funny song. I can write a cute song about oceans and, you know, and, and, and having a beer on the beach. I, that's easy. It was really hard to dig inside myself and say, what was it about this event that struck me? And what is it, what are those things that I saw? And oddly enough, the song Ian started my mind with one line that was, um, the water higher than a tall man's head. And that's because I stood in my basement or my ground floor of my house, and the water was like right up to my head. That was where the water line mm -hmm. was on the wall. And I kept thinking, man, this water was as high as a tall man's head. I'm 6'4". That was a lot of water. <laughs> That's a lot of water. Yeah. So I started with that line, and I built a song around it. And um, so it was personal. I mean, it really was personal to me. What are my observations? And I have a line about, you know, uh, piles of people's lives, um, you know, dragged out into the street like so much trash in the Florida heat. I mean, it's just like that was what hit me. It was, I still have a vision of my foosball table, which my wife was never fond of anyway. But I was very fond of my foosball table. <laughs> and it's, it was just sitting on end in that pile of trash out in front of my house. It was a very sad thing for me to see. I bet. And my old saxophone. <laughs> my old saxophone also got flooded away, and, and, I, and it was already rusted. And just, I mean, just in a matter of days, the thing just falls oh, well, apart. Yeah, all the stuff that gets inside. Yeah. And so I, there it was, sitting there as a pile of trash at the curb. My saxophone that I'd had with me for 40 years, just gone like that. A lot of memories gone. So we would love to hear that song. Can you play it for us? I can. I, I have to go get my guitar, but we'll do a quick edit and I'll like that and it'll just be like yeah, magic. We can do that. Late September, storm rolled in, 20 feet of water and a freight train wind. People should have left, but some folks stayed, and water just washed them away. This old town ain't never gonna be the same. Shake your fist at the sky, but there's no one to blame. God can't hear you when the sky turns to lead. And the water rises higher than a tall man's head You swear the devil's screaming when that hot wind blows Your home disappears in the Gulf of Mexico Gulf of Mexico Sun comes up, another beautiful day, except everything is gone, everything has changed. Piles of people's lives dragged into the street like so much trash 
in the Florida heat. The president flies down, shakes some hands, says some words on TV. Then he flies off again. God can't hear you when the sky turns to lead. And the water rises higher than a tall man's head. You swear the devil's screaming when that hot wind blows. And your home disappears in the Gulf of Mexico. Gulf of Mexico. We'll be back, and it won't take long, cause we're all half crazy and Florida strong. Even God can't hear you when the sky turns to lead, and the water rises higher than a tall man's head. And you swear the devil's screaming when that hot wind blows, and your home disappears in the Gulf of Mexico and your home disappears in the Gulf of Mexico where the hell do we go <laughs> at CEA Marketing, we take your business, your passion, and your why, and we sell it. If you're unsure where to start marketing your company, CEA Marketing is here to help. Our team at CEA has tons of experience and top-notch training, which helps you take all the stress and confusion out of marketing your own business. After years of working with large companies like Pulte Homes and Metro Places, we guarantee the successful implementation of a marketing strategy. Thank you for being on my podcast I, today. It's a real pleasure. It was so much fun. I, this, this is cool for me <laughs> to have somebody ask me the questions instead of having, you know, on all my Facebook Lives I do. I will sit there and sometimes talk for 35, 40 minutes all by myself, which I'm quite capable of doing each one I've noticed. <laughs> but uh, it's nice to have somebody to talk to and, and, and explain what's going on, and I... I hope out of this that, that somebody gets, you know, that comes away with the idea that, uh, you know, Fort Myers Beach, we're, we're resilient, we're, we're getting through it, um, and it can be done, and there are still places you can help out, and, and ways you can help, whether it's helping me out with music, it, it doesn't matter. Just mm -hmm. find somebody to help, help them out. It's, you can do it. Yeah, and a lot of people always ask me, um, how can we help? Yeah. And I know that... Uh, a lot of listeners for this podcast are, you know, a lot of people local in the area of Clearwater. And we know that all of us that live here that we dodged a bullet. You did dodge a bullet. We Matter of fact, my wife and I driving up today says, man, just think if that storm would have come where they said it was going to come, which was right here. Yes. How different our lives would be right now. Right. And I know we're, you know, we always think about Fort Myers. And I think it's important for our community to, to learn and if you're interested in um, following Stephen, I put links on um, in the show notes of mm -hmm. your Facebook page, of your website, mm -hmm. a link to your music um, for all Apple my Podcasts. Website and my schedule, if you happen to be in the Fort Myers Beach area, I'd love to. I play a lot of gigs nowadays, more than I expected. <laughs> yep, you need to go down there and listen and come down on September 23rd, 28th. 20, oh, 28th. September 28th yep. for the we're big gonna, event. We're going to put something, Chris and I are going to put something big together. Yep. We so don't we know what. <laughs> it's going to be big. Got to come to Fort Myers for that, for sure. And make sure you donate. Okay. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time on Learning Curves. Second Soul Studios is a full-service production studio with capabilities for photo, video, podcasting, editing, co-working, and more. Our photo video studio has a number of different backdrop choices and props to choose from. We also have a gourmet kitchen set, or if you're an upstar podcaster, you'll love our four-person podcast studio. So what are you waiting for? Visit secondsoulstudios.com to book a tour today.